Coming up on Lawmakers, Governor Sonny Perdue signs the measure having the state's natural gas sales tax. Senators talk with students about protecting scholarship funds through the Hope Chest Amendment. And Georgia's Supreme Court Chief Justice delivers her first State of the Judiciary Address. Those stories and more are coming up next. This is Lawmakers, Acres, your source for all the news from under the Gold Dome. Here are your anchors, Gerald Bryant and Wandy Lawson. Good evening, everyone. Also on Lawmakers, the House gives final passage to the measure that would require certain forms of ID at the, from voters at the polls. And child support legislation stirs some emotional debate in the Senate. But our lead story tonight, Governor Purdue signs legislation cutting the sales tax on heating fuel. Well, Governor Sonny Perdue signed House Bill 970 today, which cuts consumer propane and natural gas taxes in half from 4% to 2%. Republican House and Senate leadership joined Governor Perdue for this signing. Lawmakers David Zelsky joins us live with the details. David. Well, Gerald, the cuts on natural gas will be effective on January 1st and run through April 30th. Propane through March 31st, saving consumers an estimated 16 to $20 million. I want to thank these uh, members and their colleagues with almost a unanimous vote, understanding it was the right thing to do and uh, giving Georgians uh, this help to help reduce their home heating bills overall. Today's signing marks the second time in the past six months that Governor Purdue has issued temporary tax cuts, the first being a one-month suspension of the state sales tax on gasoline back in September. We're still giving back targeted tax cuts when we see unwarranted revenue windfalls such as the gasoline tax and this, mostly because it's the right thing to do, but certainly because we understand the effect that home heating uh, costs have on our family budgets. However, the Democratic leadership held a press conference today saying this is just a small temporary fix to a much larger problem. That apparently is the energy policy of this administration, is, a, is for three months give a tax break. That's it. The long term on sustainable energy, on how you regulate natural gas, how you balance that with the public's interest is not even being discussed. So we as Democrats introduced the bill to get that discussion out here so we can have that for the public. Now the governor mentioned at the end of the press conference that there are no immediate plans to re-regulate the national, natural gas industry and that Georgians are still paying below the national average. Reporting live, I'm David Zelsky for Lawmakers. Thank you very much, David. The controversial voter ID bill cleared its final legislative hurdle today when the House agreed to Senate changes to Senate Bill 84. Yesterday, the Senate amended the House version to require that the free voter identification be issued only to registered voters and that evidence of voter registration instead of a Social Security card be used to get the ID. House Minority Leader DeVos Porter today argued that large numbers of voters would be disenfranchised by the legislation. This new act, this new part that we were passing this time, would then have to go to the Justice Department for approval or disapproval that, confirmation. That, Isn't that correct? That is correct. And that the earliest that that could possibly happen where this bill or law can go into effect, at the earliest would probably be late spring or early summer. Now, I, think the, I think the Justice approval. Department has 60 days to review it. Uh, and if they have to, so this is January, no, it could be the end of March. I realistically expect. So March and there's a, we, and isn't it true we have about 450, 450,000 people in Georgia who we suspect do not have some type of photo identification according to the Secretary of State's health? I, well, I don't believe that statement. I think that's erroneous and that's erroneous information from the Secretary of State. It, isn't it true that's the information that we've gotten from that department? I understand that she wants to posit that without any documentation of that other than her uh, uh, unsubstantiated statement. Then is it true the governor of the state said last spring when he signed a bill that we estimated over 300,000 Georgians? I, 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 I do not know that to be true. I, I don't believe there's that many people, but we're about to find out. We're going to have 159 places for them to go. The House agreed to the Senate amendments by a vote of 111 to 60. That measure now requires the governor's signature and clearance from the U.S. Justice Department.
Today, the Senate Higher Education Committee passed the resolution known as the Hope Chest Initiative. The initiative is part of Governor Sonny Perdue's agenda that he says will protect the Hope Scholarship. For the meeting, the committee took a short trip across downtown Atlanta. Lawmakers Jesse Freeman joins us live with more on that story. Jesse. Well, thank you, Gerald. In a very brief meeting today, the Senate Higher Education Committee unanimously passed the Governor's Hope Chest Initiative. They did so at the campus of Georgia State University and took the opportunity to make it an educational experience. The Senate and Higher Education Committee met today on the campus of Georgia State University to pass the Governor's Hope Chest Initiative. That would restrict lottery funds primarily to the Hope Scholarship and Pre-K funding. We want to make sure that, that as a legislative body we, we give the people of Georgia the opportunity to do that. After it passed unanimously, Chairman Seth Harp explained to the students who were present how a bill becomes a law. This legislation took extra explanation because it is a resolution and requires a ballot question where voters would have to vote on this language. Shall the Constitution of Georgia be amended to protect lottery funds so that they may be reserved only for the Hope Scholarship Program and other tuition grants, scholarships, or loans to enable citizens of the state to attend colleges and universities within this state for voluntary pre-kindergarten and for educational shortfall reserves? Senator Joseph Carter explains why he thinks people should vote yes. Over the last uh, 10 years in this state, if you, um, if you look at the data of how lottery proceeds have been spent, we have spent some $1.8 billion, uh, maybe even $1.9 billion if you, if you look at that number, on things other than the HOPE scholarship and our pre-kindergarten program. That's not to say that, that some of those projects weren't, weren't good projects, weren't uh, worthy projects in the communities where they were found. But it's not what the people of Georgia signed up for when we put this lottery for education in place. Now the educational time was cut short because the committee had to get back for the state of the judiciary speech and arrived late because of the child support debate on the Senate floor. But the members of the committee did take a few moments to meet some of the students after the meeting. Reporting live, I'm Jesse Freeman for Lawmakers. Thank you, Jesse. One day after Cobb County residents packed the school board meeting to voice their opinions about a plan to balance the racial enrollment of two high schools, the House passed a measure to prohibit the Cobb School Board from redistricting based on race. Although the local legislation calendar is generally adopted without debate, Representative Alicia Thomas Morgan argued that bill sponsor Earl Earhart had not consulted the Cobb delegation before introducing the measure, which she says removes local control. If, in fact, this bill was in your committee for several days, how it is that Representative Earhart just dropped this on Monday? If that's several days, today is Wednesday. And in fact, this bill has moved in record history, and we have not had the opportunity to oppose or to even speak of this bill. And I'll what you are asking today is irresponsible to ask people to vote on a bill that is promoting segregation in Cobb County. And I am now, in the now, delegation, Morgan, and I am trying to get that point Turn the microphone off. No, I'm going to tell you what you're not going to do. You're not going to accuse a member of this body and a chairman of acting irresponsibly. You're not going to do that. You're not going to, that is a violation of the rules of this house, and I'm not going to do that to you, and you're not going to do that to him or any other member. Now, if you want to talk to Mr. Smith, he said it's been several days. I don't know if, it's, if Monday would constitute several days. When was the bill in your committee, Representative Smith? Uh, the bill, I think, was put in there on Monday, and it followed the procedure that all local bills follow. The, uh, the House has certain rules. We, we're uh, obligated to go by to get a bill to the floor of the House, and this bill followed those rules just like any other local it, bill. Was it would advertised follow. in the local paper? It was, it was done in accordance with the advertising was done, and, and every, uh, every requirement of uh, this House was followed by the local bill. Now, what, what is being argued is the substance of the bill. I had no role at all. As a matter of fact, um, I heard about it and read about it in the newspapers. I um, saw it on television. But even as a member of the delegation, not had an opportunity to discuss this bill. It was rushed through the process because he is chairman of the Rules Committee, and he is very powerful, and people don't have the courage to stand up against him, even when they know it's right. Now, the entire docket of local legislation passed by a vote of 111 to 47 and now moves to the Senate. The Cobb County School Board is expected to vote on the redistricting plan in early February. In other news, the state Senate today passed a bill that's the next step in revising Georgia's child support system. One major provision would factor in the income of both custodial and non-custodial parent when determining child support payments.
This bill brings Georgia into the 21st century. We will be one of 37 states that uses the income shares model. Now, one other little statistics. Everybody said, well, the old system was working fine. No, it wasn't, folks. We did a sampling of 11 counties, and we found that in 41% of the cases that were sampled, and we used a statistical method, our statisticians figured that out, 41% of the child support cases in Georgia deviated from the standards that we had. One controversial provision of the bill would pave the way for non-custodial parents to pay less child support if that parent keeps a child a minimum number of days per year. The trigger is 91 days to get any reduction. And the trigger, if you will think about it in this manner, here we have the child support based on 100% with the custodial parent. Only when the child has been with the non-custodial parent a quarter of the year does the bill recognize and allow for a reduction in the basic support order. Several senators didn't believe the 91-day rule was fair and didn't take into account that the custodial parent has ongoing expenses related to child care. Both Senators Renee Unterman and Steve Thompson were among those offering amendments. When you visit your children and you're a good daddy and you visit your children it doesn't stop the monthly expenses that the mother has as the custodial parent. It doesn't stop the upkeep and the daily school monies and the lunches and the things they send and the, and the trips. It doesn't stop there. It kind of sticks in my crawl the fact that women usually get are the custodial parents and they usually get the kids Monday through Friday. And then the non-custodial parent gets it on the weekend. And it really aggravates me that the women folk have to do the grunt work. We're always the ones who have to send them to school, feed them, take them to their appointments, take them to their activities. You know, in today's world, 24 hours is a long, long time. And a lot of those mothers are already working. It's, it's, it's very excruciating to fit these schedules in and then to think that you hand off on Saturday and Sunday that quality time of when the non-custodial parent gets the kids. They get to go to the movies, they get to go swimming, maybe they have one music lesson, they get to go to church, they get to go to Sunday school. Basically what they have is the fun time. Senator Unterman's amendment to increase the trigger to 121 days of non-custodial parental care passed. So did the child support bill. The final vote was 38 to 17. That bill moves to the House. Georgia's Supreme Court Chief Justice Leah Sears delivered her first State of the Judiciary Address today. She told a joint session of the General Assembly that among the accomplishment of the Georgia court systems are the new drug courts. In recent years, Georgia has experienced and experimented heavily with what are called accountability courts. That these courts have been called the most significant criminal justice initiatives in the past century. Our drug courts have been a resounding success, thanks in large part to the work of Judge George Krieger of Cobb County. Judge Krieger is chair of the Judicial Council Standing Committee on Drug Courts. Alcohol and drug abuse figure predominantly and prominently in the majority of our criminal cases in Georgia. We currently have 39 operating drug courts in Georgia, but our goal is to have drug courts in all 49 circuits. These courts are holding offenders accountable, saving the state and the local government money, and changing lives. And Chief Justice Sears also said she was concerned about the growing number of domestic relations cases, which she said outnumber felony and misdemeanor cases combined. Two-thirds of the young people convicted of major felonies from 1970 to 1995 came from single or no-parent families. 
One of the ways that we have chosen to address this problem was to institute the Family Court Pilot Project. That project is designed to consolidate multiple domestic relations cases involving the same family under one judge so that the decision-making process is consistent. But I think it is also important, in fact it is critical, for us to begin to deal with the legal crisis that has been created by the disintegration of the family. We must restore the importance of marriage and family as the foundation of our society. And we'll have more from Chief Justice Sears' address later in our broadcast. During the Democrats' weekly press conference this afternoon, they announced four new bills aimed to reform current laws regarding eminent domain. Democrats say Republican bills over the past two years have attempted to allow government to seize people's land and turn it over to private developers. Senator Emanuel Jones discussed four bills which aim to reform eminent domain, but first, Senate Minority Leader rather Robert Brown spoke on that issue. Senate Bill 414 surfaced again this year. And now we've seen a number of other bills that have emerged uh, on the issue of eminent domain. Um, we think it's important for people to put this in perspective and understand that we have been consistent on this issue uh, and insisting that uh, the public, the, the private property of individuals not be taken uh, for any use that's not appropriate. In other words, it needs to be a public use and not be transferred for the use of a private developer. As part of the Landowners Bill of Rights, we have uh, instructed uh, DCA to promulgate uh, a notices that can be sent to all condemnees that would explain up front, prior to any condemnation process being undertaken, what their rights are, what their appeal rights are, and what their rights are as property owners. Senator Jones says all four bills have bipartisan support. He says one of those Republicans is Senate President Pro Tem Eric Johnson. Georgia could be celebrating Ronald Reagan Day by February 6, 2007, if a bill passed by the House today makes its way through the General Assembly. House Bill 713, introduced by Marietta Representative Bobby Franklin, would designate the day to honor the former president without making it a state holiday. While most legislators expressed support for the idea, some questioned the process for selecting honorees. I'll vote for this bill, and I appreciate you bringing it, but I wonder whether any other presidents have such days in Georgia named after them. I did not do the research on that. Do you know if we first honored our own um, uh, president, son of the South, uh, son of Georgia, uh, Jimmy Carter? Uh, I'm sure you know. I don't. I'm asking. I, I do not know. Thank you. I do believe that we ought to do this for Ronald Reagan, but I believe there are some other presidents we ought to do it for, including uh, Eisenhower, who had a Georgia connection, and others, and Jimmy Carter. So I would urge you to vote for this today. It's the right thing to do. Uh, but let's think about this, and let's think about it the way that, that this body is thinking about naming buildings and naming roads and naming other things. Let's be sensible. Let's be thoughtful. And let's plan ahead before we just completely uh, take all of our days to honor people that someday nobody will ever remember. House Bill 173 passed by a vote of 138 to 19, and it now moves to the Senate. Two state senators submitted bills this morning that would prevent cell phone providers from selling customer records. Lawmakers J.R. Charles is live at the Capitol with more on this story. J.R. Thanks, Nwandi. Many cell phone providers keep customer accounts private, but many information brokers get these records illegally. Senators David Schaefer and John Wiles want to make it a felony to sell customer records without the customer's consent. The penalty for breaking these proposed laws? Ten years in prison and a $100,000 fine. And that may sound excessive, but the two senators say a customer's privacy is priceless. You must understand that there's no legal way other than through a subpoena to get this information. So it's either being stolen or through subterfuge, it's being taken uh, from the private, individual, the private companies. Uh, so this is, there's wrongdoing somewhere and we don't believe it to be with the, the cell phone companies, the providers. We think it's you know, the, somebody basically using subterfuge or stealing the records. 
This information belongs to each of us. It's personal and it's private and it ought to be legally protected. And it's an outrageous invasion of privacy that is so readily available to strangers. The two senators' bills will have their first readings in the Senate tomorrow and move to the Science and Technology Committee. Senator David Schaefer, who chairs that committee, says he hopes for a floor vote in the next couple of weeks. Reporting live, I'm J.R. Charles for Lawmakers. Thanks so much, J.R. We return now to more comments from Georgia's Chief Supreme Court Justice, Leah Ward Sears. She made her first State of the Judiciary Address today and told members of the General Assembly about her concerns over judicial independence. Informed discourse and debate all are the hallmarks of the American democratic tradition. But it is not the role of a judge to try cases in the court of public opinion. Rather, it is the job of a judge to be a fair and impartial arbiter of conflict. It is the job of a judge to interpret the laws that you make in light of sound legal reasoning and well-established precedent not based on personal feelings, politics, or opinion polls. Finally, it is the job of a good judge to protect the rights of all people without regard to race, creed, social, or economic status. Now, before I close, I want to take a moment and address the needs of the statewide public defender system in Georgia, which you created to the, during the 2003 session and you fund it in the 2005 fiscal year budget. That system, I am pleased to report, is off to a great start. Now, as you know, there are three essential parts of the criminal justice system. There are the courts led by the judges, you have the prosecutors, and then you have the defenders. As such, the criminal justice system is like a three-legged stool. Now, we all know that a two-legged stool won't stand up. And that's what we had at Georgia for, for a long time, a two-legged stool. But thankfully, with the creation of a statewide indigent defense system, we now have all three components that we need, so we're on a firm foundation. All I ask at this time is that you commit, continue the commitment that, to fund that system that you created two years ago. In other news, today in the Senate Transportation Committee meeting, Deputy Director Larry Dent of the Georgia Department of Transportation briefed committee members on the progress of a public-private initiative. There is no legislation involved in this presentation, but Transportation Chairman Bill Stevens said it was the responsibility of the committee to stay informed about what the DOT was doing with public-private initiatives. Dent spent most of his time talking about the project to widen and add pay lanes to the I-575 and I-75 corridors. We're in the, the middle stages almost of that process. When we do that, we're going to have a lot of resources that we're going to look at. And, and on this next slide, you'll see all the things that we'll take into consideration, all the studies we've done. We've done uh, a, a lot of truck lane studies. We've done our tiered HOV studies. We've got a whole lot of different studies throughout the state that uh, we've done that we will, we will put all that into the blender to, to help develop that list of projects that, that we'll have. So we'll use a lot of that. The project is being contracted by a group called Georgia Transportation Partners. That group made an unsolicited proposal to the DOT. During the presentation, Senator John Douglas questioned the Deputy Commissioner about why that corridor had been chosen as opposed to some of the more congested areas south of the city. Well, the, ultimately, that was an unsolicited proposal on 75 575. Somebody walked in the door and said, I've got some money and I'm willing to invest it in DOT with DOT to fix this problem. Senator Douglas said he wanted the department to be aware that he believed more attention needed to be paid to other areas of the city than just the I-75 and 575 corridor. Deputy Commissioner Dent says that project will probably be completed by 2013. He says the department has a plan to begin to address other congested areas of the city in the coming years. Georgia's 8th District Congressman Led Westmoreland was at the Capitol today to visit old friends until a couple of years ago he served at the state capitol as a representative and minority leader in the House. Thank you. Thank you, Mitch and Governor. Um, 
it's, it's good to be here. And, uh, I, you know, one of the things I used to hate about being in the State House is when the congressman would come talk to us for about 20 minutes. So uh, I'm, I'm, I appreciate that, and I've been there and done that, so I'm going to keep it very short. But uh, we had an opportunity today to stop by the Capitol. We uh, gave a speech uh, at the airport this morning, and we're doing one uh, where we had a luncheon down here, and we're going to Columbus. So it was just too good an opportunity to pass up and to come by and to visit with my friends that uh, I serve both uh, here in the House and then some of you kind of lost your IQ and got over here, but uh, it's, been a, it's been a pleasure with uh, working with y'all and like Ed Harbison and others that uh, I've worked with in the congressional delegation. It's just been a real honor and it's been a pleasure and I've taken a lot of the things that I learned uh, here under this gold dome about building relationships and, and working with people and, and uh, being able just to relate to uh, every person, whether you were on which side of the aisle you were on or whatever people you represented, just to know that your heart was representing those people that elected you to come up here and do that work. And, and that's what I've tried to do. Uh, I think that uh, it's not an easy thing when you try to represent 700,000 people, but uh, it's been such a pleasure and such a joy that I've had in doing it. And I will never forget you, my friends uh, that I've served with down here, and I think about you quite often. Uh, and what you mean to me and my family and what you mean to this state. So I just wanted to come by, say hello to all of you, uh, wish you well, tell you that I think you're doing a great job whether you're in the majority or the minority. I never had an opportunity to serve here in the majority, but I served many years in the minority. And there are still great opportunities that you can find in the minority uh, to serve your citizens. So um, I congratulate my Republican friends. I encourage my Democrat friends. Thank you and God bless you. Moments after passing the voter ID bill this afternoon, the mood in the House lightened considerably thanks to a visit from American Idol finalist and Columbus, Georgia native Justin Guarini. I'm here in Georgia uh, representing uh, Safe America Foundation, which is helping teens drive safer. And um, it's really a pleasure to be here. I'm promoting my new album and everything, and I just wanted to say hello. Oh, sing of happy, not sad. Sing. Sing a song, make it simple, to last your whole life long. No, don't worry that it's not good enough for anyone else to hear. Sing, sing a song. to see how Georgia works. Thank you very much. Well, coming up tomorrow on Lawmakers, Secretary of State Kathy Cox kicks off her campaign for governor, and the late U.S. Senator Paul Coverdale is memorialized at the Capitol. All that in the latest from Under the Gold Dome tomorrow night at 7. If you've missed any part of this Lawmakers broadcast, tune in tomorrow morning when Lawmakers repeats at 5.30 a.m. Now stay tuned for Georgia Outdoors. That's coming up next here on GPB. That is our broadcast for this, the eighth legislative day of the Georgia General Assembly. I'm Gerald Bryant. And I'm Wandy Lawson. Thanks for joining us. Have a great evening. Bye-bye. This has been a production of Georgia Public Broadcasting.